Hi, everyone. I wanted to welcome you all to American College of Traditional Chinese Medicine's webinar, How to Manifest Good Health in the Year of the Metal Ox. Um, if you haven't already, take some time to just introduce yourself, um, tell us a little bit about your experience with Chinese medicine, where you're coming from. Um, just as a reminder, this session will be recorded and a recording will be sent to all attendees afterwards. Um, so I just uh, wanted to share that this is also part of our Revitalize webinar series, which is a regular webinar series where we invite guest faculty and alumni speakers to share about Chinese medicine. Um, next slide. Um, I'm Dr. Rachel Lamb and host of this series. I am a graduate from ACTCM's doctoral program and I have my private practice fountain acupuncture in San Francisco. Um, one of my goals in working with ACTCM and putting this series together was to really showcase the diversity and expansiveness of Chinese medicine. Um, and really offer some new perspectives on the medicine, um, which is why I'm very excited today to have our guest, uh, Dr. Heming Cho. Um, as you all know, Lunar New Year is quickly approaching and it will be this Friday. Um, and many of us have been busy with preparations um, for really welcoming the new year. Um, this period is uh, really a celebration of the coming spring season and Dr. Cho will share a bit more about the meaning behind the year of the metal ox, the importance of aligning our bodies with the energetic shifts in our environment um, and what we can simply do in our everyday to better support our well-being. Um, really hope that this is something that um, you can take away something practical to apply to your lives. Um, throughout the presentations, feel free to submit um, any questions you might have in the Q&A um, option in the bottom of your screen. And um, we'll have some time at the end of the presentation to answer some questions as well. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with ACTCM, um, I wanted to share just a little bit about our school. Um, we were founded in 1980 and are one of the oldest Chinese medicine schools in the US. We offer masters and doctoral programs in acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine, as well as public programs um, through continuing education courses through our sister school, CIAS. Next slide. Um, but without further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Heming Cho. She is a licensed acupuncturist and herbalist, a classical Korean and Chinese medicine doctor, activist, martial artist, teacher, meditator, writer, and intuitive chakra healer. She founded Body Dao Acupuncture in San Francisco in 2013 following the lineage of the revered Korean medicine doctor, Master Yu, combining Korean acupressure and Tui Na in conjunction with acupuncture, Dr. Cho specializes in emotional balancing, spiritual insight, pain, stress, and fertility, and will be teaching Tui Na, which is Chinese medical massage at ACTCM. Um, so I will let Dr. Cho, take it away. Hi, everyone. Am okay. I on screen? Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you to the whole team at ACTCM CIS that's put this together. I'm really excited to be here and I want to wish you all a happy new year. Xinyan Kaila. And in Korean, it's also Sebok Mani Padaseo. Um, the first thing I wanted to do before we begin is to invite everyone to take a moment of calm and stillness to ground and land, 
to center yourselves and to also put a big, beautiful protective shield. I want to acknowledge the land that we are standing on right now, which is Ohlone Ramaitush, and to acknowledge the lands of our ancestors. For me, it is Hunger. Today we begin, can I have the next slide, please? <laughs> Sorry, I'm new at this. Um, talking about the just the overview of what you will be learning today. This is an introductory type of mm -hmm. webinar so that anyone with any level of experience should be able to engage with this. We're going to cover the significance of the Lunar New Year, the transition from winter to spring, our relationship with the seasons and nature, and how to use Chinese medicine to support our health. Next slide. So this is the Lunar New Year, the year of the metal ox. Next slide. People may have heard of the 12 animals and the five elements and not quite known what to do with them. Um, every year it rotates to a different animal and it goes yin to yang, yang to yin. Next slide. So what is the energy of the ox? The ox is a metaphor for those characteristics of the entire year and also for us personally of being hardworking, determined, strong, grounded, carefully treading, finding the right path. It is a yin animal and so it has the ability to manifest. And it does this through kindness and generosity, through diligence. Last year was a very difficult year for many of us. It was a very young and outward facing year, um, metal rat. It, there was a lot of fiery change and challenge and those things do bring opportunity and challenges, but this year is more of a yin inward facing year that will be more about recovery, rejuvenation, and then each of us planting the seeds for a better and wiser course for ourselves, our families, communities, and hopefully for the world. Next slide. So what is the energy of metal? Metal of all the five elements in Chinese medicine is perhaps the most difficult to comprehend, but if you think of it as a metaphor for alchemy, so the ancients would boil down various things until they came up with a pure substance and that pure substance was metal. So it represents alchemy, transformation from one form to another, structure like the metal gate around a house, discernment, uh, fine tuning and perceiving differences between one thing and the next creating really appropriate strong boundaries, <laughs> clearly stating what you need, what you want, what you will not accept. This is all very healthy um, and a great reminder of how to really embellish and draw upon metal energy, even if that is not your constitution. But a metal constitution really has a great deal of precision, discipline, high self-worth, respectfulness, Metal is about being principled and also in a human life, adjusting to loss with resilience. So metal is very complementary to ox energy because it has this ability to choose and be very discerning. And then the ox energy is going to be constantly dutifully manifesting on the earth plane. I just wanted to point out that these are two real swords in the center <laughs> and these are acupuncture needles if you don't recognize it and the gold in the pot sort of represents manifesting resources, the resources that you need. Next slide please. So what is the importance of the ritual and ceremony that we have along with the Lunar New Year? One of the things that I like to remind my patients of is that uh, every time in the history of the world has been the modern time. But when we 
connect ourselves to the ancestors and to the ancients, we can remember more deeply and more fully how to be human. So traditions, rituals, ceremonies are ways for us as humans to connect together with larger groups of people and to call in the energies of that time. And so Lunar New Year is really for, particularly for Asian people, the most celebrated, most important time of year. We are saying goodbye to the old and saying hello to the new. We gather together with friends and family. We give each other gifts. We, um, we ask for blessings for ourselves and for the world and we eat special foods. I know everybody has special foods. What Koreans are eating right now is the uh, dumplings that you make by hand all together from scratch, <laughs> if we have the time. And um, I think dumplings are, you know, also in Chinese culture and several other places. So uh, next slide. So cleaning, cleaning and clearing seems to be a worldwide uh, unifying ritual, which is in order to say goodbye to the old, you have to literally physically clear out your entire space, your, the inside of every jar, your entire kitchen to clean every piece of clothing that you have. This is a huge undertaking, but as you go through the process of physicalizing you're letting go and saying goodbye, it invites and creates a space for new energy and new experiences, new relationships, new visions and inspirations. And I think that that's what we all need today is vision and hope. Next slide. So how are we celebrating this transition from winter to spring? Um, these are some great images of how winter has this beautiful snow and cold and grayer skies, shorter days. And in order to survive through that condition, we put on all of our snuggly clothes and we sit by a fire with friends. We have heavier foods, more soup, more root vegetables, uh, things that are going to really ground us and help us to repair and nurture so that whatever activities we did in the past year can be somewhat detoxified and undone. And we can prepare ourselves in the same way that trees do by really focusing our energy on our roots, looking inward, thinking about ourselves and where we want to go and just really creating a deeper downtime and quiet time in your spirit and soul, as well as your body. And then moving into spring, you start to see the sun coming out earlier and little sprouts shooting up through the ground. And this is an energy that is very, very different. It's starting to wake up. It's starting to spring forth. It's starting to make plans and, and go out earlier and begin the process of actually planting and, and growth. Next slide. So what is the relationship between nature and you? Chinese medicine is based on this foundational concept that we are attempting to emulate nature in its most balanced and harmonious form. And all of us, just like all of our gardens and all of uh, the places in the world need tending and cultivating. That to be truly preventative and proactive, we need daily care, not just for the body, but also for your mind, heart, and spirit. So inside our bodies is an internal environment and outside of our bodies is this external environment. And those two things interact with one another. They feed each other, they emulate one another. And sometimes we're in contradiction to each other. And so we have to find the ways in which we can live more 
harmoniously internally with our, our diet, our exercises and mental patterns and externally in the way that we're speaking and inspiring and acting in the world. Next slide. So this is a beautiful quote from the Neijing Suwen, which is the inner classic of basic questions. Thus, knowing how is the maintenance of life. Do not fail to observe the four seasons and to adapt to heat and cold, to harmonize elation and anger, and to be calm in activity as in rest. In this way, having deflected the perverse energies, there will be long life and everlasting vision. In Chinese medicine, we engage with the very ancient classics to ground our understanding of how to apply this philosophy, these concepts, this theory to the body and in our daily practices and in the way that we cultivate and nourish health, which is very different than simply avoiding illness or avoiding um, injury. Next slide. So let us begin with thinking about what is the energy and nature of winter? Winter is imbued with energies of darkness, sinking, holding, transforming. Winter is mysterious. There's a lot more dark but dark is not an absence of light. Dark is something in and of itself. For instance, underneath the ground, it is dark. <laughs> it is wet and things are sinking downward. This is an energy that you can actually cultivate in, cultivating that depth, the penetrating thoughts, the resting fully your mind and heart in a much quieter way. So winter and water, kidneys and bladder are all connected together. They are sourced within each other. Winter being the season of water, we'll begin looking at the water constitution. It has the archetype of the sage and counselor, healer. The water element controls the kidneys, urinary bladder, the brain, endocrine system, and adrenal glands. So the endocrine system is one of the more recently researched systems. It's all of the hormones that control action in the body. The adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys like little caps, and they are, are sort of energetic storehouse, but they only get triggered to sort of fight or flight action when we're under stress. And as a lot of people know in modern life, we're having way too much stress. Um, so this is what we're trying to counteract. Next slide. So what is the spirit of water? Spirit of water is, uh, sure, <laughs> sorry, I'm <laughs> struggling with the tones. Um, Jur is will and intent. So when you think about the kidneys and the urinary bladder, they are embodying what we think of as the, the backbone, right? The strength, the will, the determination to, to persevere and to conquer even when there are stressors or challenges to the system. So a healthy water element would be giving you courage, willpower, creativity, determination, and wisdom. And unbalanced water, you will notice more fear, anxiety, a feeling of paralyzed will, kind of dread and inhibition, uh, the lack of that sense that you will survive, that you mm -hmm. have the stamina to move forward. So this concept of sure is very, very important because when you cultivate your will and intent, you feel very calm because you know that you have the strength to survive. Next slide. 
what is the energy and nature of spring? So spring is literally springy. It's springing forth. It has green energy, the energy of a blade of grass that can make it up through concrete, through, through impediments, hard, dry mud in order to find the sun. That kind of springing up energy is very young. It's warming, it rises up, it's forceful and vigorous. In Chinese medical theory, liver and gallbladder are connected to wood and control the tendons, ligaments, it opens to the eyes, it affects your eyesight. Wood is a kind of activation energy, so it's constantly striving. And you'll notice that the people in your life who have a lot of wood energy or our wood constitution have this kind of incessant driving forward. But at the same time, if it doesn't get to drive forward, it can become very frustrated and angry. So there's a healthy balance to wood. Next slide. The spirit of wood is hun, and hun is ethereal or heavenly soul. It's the ability to see a higher vision and purpose. And uh, we believe that the hun is of all of the spirits, it is the one that persists beyond this mortal life that if you uh, believe in reincarnation as I do, that hun is the spirit that is everlasting. And so it's interesting to think of it as being connected to liver and that striving energy um, because it, in a way it explains why the visionary strategic planning and follow through come from the everlasting essential and ancient part of ourselves. And when it is unbalanced, it can lead to anger, irritation, frustration, stress. You might find that you're in constant activity with no accomplishment, that you're just restless. Next slide. So what are the daily habits that support well-being during this seasonal transition? As you can see, Eating and eating well is one of the best things that you can do for your entire lifetime because you are essentially bringing in materials that detox, that nourish, that hold you up, drinking water, filling you up, using minerals and good fats, well-sourced proteins, Regardless of what you're coping with, whether it's an injury or if it's uh, mood imbalances, hormonal imbalances, mental focus, if you eat really well, if you give yourself the things that are very medicinal to you, food as medicine, you will immediately begin to feel better, more concrete and centered. So nourishment is very important. Stretching. Stretching is a way of bringing all of the energy from the various parts of the body into harmony with each other. You'll notice that if you're sitting too long, which a lot of us have been doing, everything is a little bit stagnant, your joints are creaky. So getting up once an hour, doing a one minute stretch, breathing deeply, all of this will help regulate your energy and bring your bring the blood and chi up to your head so that you can have better thoughts. Sleep is particularly important because it's the time of day when the body is detoxing itself and everything is cleaning and clearing inside your body ecology. So most people in the world are having real difficulties with sleep, whether it comes from anxiety or overwork or worry, it immediately impacts the quality of your sleep, the length of time in which you're sleeping, uh, being able to rest through the night without having to get up, waking up at an appropriate time, not popping out of bed with lots of images of the things that you need to do. So creating a kind of sleep pattern and ritual that helps you to ground and center, that 
cools your body to the right temperature so that you can feel very relaxed. This is very, very important. And in a healthy life, you will see good eating, movement that is appropriate, and deep sleep. So if any of those things are imbalanced, it's really critical to work on those things. The last two images, um, one is the body clock, that there is a circadian rhythm. We are animals, just like crabs and giraffes, worms. We have the same need to be doing things at the right time for ourselves, so that if we have an upside down time clock and we have to work at night, for instance, your body is not ever going to fully detox itself, repair tissues, calm the mind, and nourish all of the cells and structures in your body. So it's really vital that you try to sleep between the hours of 10 p.m. and maybe 6 a.m., depending on where you are in the world. It's not actually winter turning to spring in the lower hemisphere. Um, there are other parts of the circadian rhythm that people will notice, uh, also having to do with, with food and digestion. Uh, the stomach is the most active and has the most energy for absorption and breaking down nutrients from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And so the old adage of eating like a, what is it, a uh, prince in the morning, a king at night, and a pop, uh, a king at midday, and a pauper in the evening, that's actually very helpful to nourish yourself immediately as you wake up within the first 30 minutes, at least giving yourself something to eat and drink, and then having a medium-sized meal. At lunchtime, thinking of that being your real dinner, <laughs> where you have all of the different food groups and, and two portions of vegetables, a good solid two ounces of protein, some healthy fats, and whatever, um, whatever carbs, whether it's rice or sweet potatoes or noodles um, that really feed you well, that's the noontime meal so that your body has lots of time to utilize that energy from breakfast and lunch and then moving into dinner. I know that in the modern world, we tend to sort of save up all of our, our hunger for the dinner um, meal and we might start that really late at 8 30 or 9 um, but in order to really cultivate better rest especially in the winter time where you're trying to sleep longer maybe nine hours or eight hours instead of just seven or eight it's really critical to think in terms of giving yourself three hours in between the dinner and beginning to wind down and sleep because having a full stomach when you go straight to bed is definitely going to interrupt your sleep. Another thing is that the, the dinner time, maybe five, six, or seven, can be a little bit lighter because you're not going to be doing your biggest mental work at that time, hopefully. And you will be able to absorb lighter things well before your body goes into its, its detox cycle. And the last image is that resting your mind, heart, and spirit is just as important as resting your body. Meditation has been proven by science and by the uh, Buddhist and other meditators throughout the world um, as a cleansing ritual that can daily help you to have a tabula rasa, just a clean slate on which to begin to have new ideas. If your mind, heart, spirit is constantly cluttered and never shifts out of busyness and activity, there's a sort of anxious anxiety and constant hum that will inhibit you from really producing your best work and being fully present in the present moment. Next slide. 
So please use Chinese medicine to support yourself during this pandemic. Uh, using tea and herbs and soup, whatever your culture has taught you to do for yourself in order to boost your immune system, to stay warm if you need to, cooling down, but cooling down uh, healthfully, not with too much cold all at once. Um, and also visiting your holistic practitioners, acupuncturist, chiropractor, physical therapist, as well as your doctors, if you're able to see them or have Zoom meetings with them. Chinese medicine in particular is, has been heralded by the World Health Organization as being the best medicine for poor people because the world has many places in which you don't have access to expensive machines, to drugs, and to specialists. But if you are able to have access to the foods, herbs, and the, the skillful understanding of how to work with yourself on a daily basis, you can maintain your health and hopefully um, stay safe as well. Next slide. So Jamie, if you can just turn off the uh, sharing for a minute, I want to share with you two demos so that you'll be able to see what it's like to do something very, very simple that should help you mentally, emotionally to stay in your center. It's called two to one breathing. And I invite you all to stand up wherever you are and to place your feet in parallel, to roll your shoulders back. Two to one breathing is very simple. As you inhale, visualize the oxygen entering the top, the middle and the bottom of your lungs. And as you exhale, you feel the crest of that wave begin and the air leaves from the top, the middle, and the bottom. And then as you inhale again, you can start to count your breath. One, two, three. And then when you find the bottom of your inhale, then you begin the exhale and it goes one, two, three, four, five, six. Begin again with the inhale. One, two, three. Exhale. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now you can use your hands to guide your chi and hold the ball. Inhale. One, two, three. And then begin the exhale. One, two, three, four, five, six. Inhale, expand the ball. One, two, three. Exhale. One, two, three, four, five, six. One more time. Inhale. One, two, three. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now bring your hands to your lower Dantian, left hand over right and thumbs uh, interlocked. Take a deep breath and just sink into the four corners of your feet, tuck the tailbone down, Slightly bow the head forward. Feel all of your joints connected. So that is two to one breathing and holding the chi bar. There is one other demonstration I wanted to share with you and hopefully you're doing this along with me. Uh, for those of you who know, Chinese medicine is deeply connected to Qigong and Tai Chi Chuan as 
ways of moving and healing and cultivating the chi and blood in your body. Uh, springtime is the time when you really want to start moving more, moving your joints. So I'm going to take you through a very brief joint, joint mobilization that is going to then sort of transform into cloud hands. <laughs> so begin with your head down and up, side to side. You can do multiples on your own ear from shoulder to shoulder. And then a very, very gentle rocking forward, not rocking back. And then that moves into the shoulder joint. Shoulders, because they've been so forward, I tend to focus on rotating them backwards and rotating and rotating. Once you rotate your shoulders like that, then you notice that your elbows and your wrists are connected to that movement. And so now you can mobilize the shoulders, the elbow, the wrist. And now if you do both wrists opposite each other, and I'm gonna rotate my hips, knees and ankles a little bit as I do this. Now you're mobilizing all of your joints and your coordinating that movement together. So one of the basics that we do in Tai Chi Chuan is called cloud hands. And what I'm doing here is I'm sinking into my horse stance, mobilizing my spine and rotating with each part of this movement, the shoulder, elbow, wrist, and fingers a little bit. I'm grounding in through my hips, my knees, ankles, and my toes. And now I'm going to reverse the cloud hands. And continue to breathe, two to one breathing as you're doing this. And what you might notice as we close, we step together, bringing the energy of the heavens down to the body and to the ground. Thank you so much. I wanted to thank Dr. Rachel Lamb and the marketing team, ACTCM, CIS, for bringing this presentation. I believe I can give it now to Rachel, who's going to handle the questions. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Cho. That was such a great presentation, and I loved all the demonstrations. I was doing it on my own here at home as well. Um, we do have some questions, or time for some questions. Um, if we'll start, uh, we can start with this one. Um, someone asked, what are some more energizing foods for springtime? So when you think about spring, think about all the little sprouts and things that are green. Think about all of the beautiful greens that we haven't been eating as many of and things that will uh, begin to feel lighter. So in the wintertime, we might have been focusing more on root vegetables like beets, carrots, and turnips. And now we want to think about sprouts and uh, baby spinach and all of the let me think, you know, lighter and activating, you can start to bring in the citruses as well. And if you don't have too much inflammation <laughs> and um, I like tofu in the springtime, I like to eat more. Um, I, I like to eat a little bit of meat, but to eat well-sourced meat and in smaller quantities. But in terms of the fruits and vegetables, I would say start to think about them in terms of colors. So brighter colors and things that are going to spring up and be more, um, yeah, springy like spinach. <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite things to also put in is like just more spring onion and everything. Yeah. When you think of like chewing on it, it's like opening up everything. It's very expansive in its energy, so. Awesome. Um, and this is sort of related on that note, but why does the temperature of food matter? 
um, energetic and actual temperature. Yes. Uh, so for those of you who know a little bit more about Chinese medicine, there are six tastes. There's sweet, sour, salty, spicy, uh, neutral, and bitter. And so each of the seasons has a particular taste profile um, and each of them amend various issues that you might be having. So for instance, the taste of spicy is hot, right? You feel warm, you start sweating, and that is an, act an action that you want to create in your body. If you have cold, if you need to release things from pathogens into the exterior, um, and then, for instance, you can think about um, cold as being, cold is generally considered a pathogen in Chinese medicine, which is why we don't like things to be iced. But uh, the temperature of things during the year will really change your body ecology. So if you, if you want to amend too much cold or stagnation in your body, it's really critical to have hot soup, hot tea, and put spices in it to be further warming like black pepper, cinnamon, ginger, garlic. Um, and I, I was trying to think of versions of cold temperature foods. And, and then it, it did occur to me, you know, Chinese have this crushed cucumber salad that I know is a favorite of a lot of people, including Dr. Lam. Um, <laughs> and, and so even if the cucumber is only room temperature, that the nature of cucumber is cooling. The nature of melon is cooling and watermelon. So for instance, even in the wintertime, if you have a heat condition in a specific part of your body, uh, that is something that you can do using those foods in a, an herbal form like um, watermelon um, dust, for instance, is cooling or mint is cooling. So if you had a heat condition on your skin, you could use mint tea as a way of, of driving that heat up and out. Yeah, Dr. Cho and I were just discussing about how, um, I mean, in modern day now, you know, you can access foods um, at all times of the year, even though it may not be in season. So something like cucumber, which is when, you know, you might be wanting to eat that it's more appropriate in the summertime, you can buy it now in the winter time. So just like being more aware of like what's in season, eating with the seasons and what's um, like maybe more available at the farmer's market versus the grocery store. Um, another question that came in, um, and I would like love to hear your opinions on um, general like liver cleanses um, and whether or not spring is a good time to do it um, or cleansing in general? Great question. Very, very important. When you're thinking about health and wellness, you have to think in terms of detoxing on a regular basis every day. You need to think about um, rest and exercise and all those things as being detoxing activities. So sleeping well is detoxing and exercising is detoxing because you're moving your lymphatic zones of the body and that's clearing things out. Um, going to the bathroom every day and having a regular bowel movement, having regularized your urine output as well. Um, one of the things that I like to think about with detoxing is that sour is the taste of, of liver, right? So having lemon water, hot lemon water, room temperature lemon water is a gentle clearing and you can put a little bit of Himalayan sea salt in that so that you're replenishing your minerals at the same time. Um, there's an unsweetened cranberry juice that's fantastic that if you use maybe one part cranberry juice and three to four parts water. Um, and then you can put ground up flax seeds in that freshly ground. Mm -hmm. That will actually go to your liver and then the oils will help pull out cholesterol, which are uh, the parts that are surrounding the toxic elements in your liver and it will clear through your intestine. So, Doing that gentle clearing, you can actually have the lemon water and the cran water 
every day throughout the year. Um, and then other cleanses, I do think that doing um, moderating foods at the end of winter when you've already nourished and you wanna kind of lighten up, doing a half fast, eating lighter, just thinking in terms of lightening your body and lightening your mind and spirit together, I think will help you to spring forth because you can't really spring forth when you're feeling really heavy and bloated and tired. <laughs> Um, that, uh, and another person actually asked in the chat that, um, you know, they sleep a lot throughout the day or at night, like they're getting a full eight hours of sleep, but they still feel very tired and groggy throughout the day. Um, kind of like what you're describing this heaviness, mm -hmm. um, what's something that they can do about that? That is really great. So, um, I'm going to step back and show you two things to do for yourself, because even if you're not going to immediately amend your, amend your, your diet and your sleep, just by uh, doing the emergency points on the fingertips right next to the nail bed, on all of your fingers and toes, you will start to feel your blood and chi moving a lot better. And then um, you can go through the fingers and then do the toes. And then you can actually use your fingertips to wake up your brain. And this will really open up a lot of stagnation that you've had at night. You can do your neck. You can then use your hand shaped like a cup over your channels. And that will also wake up your channels. I'm not going to show the lower body, but um, padding is a traditional Chinese qigong that helps to wake up your body and to bring blood and chi out to the surface and circulating. I also like to do five or 10 push ups first thing in the morning because going out and breathing cooler air and doing a few push ups, making the blood pump in your system will actually wake you up better than any drug or additive or even caffeine, because really it's your own body that has all of the materials in there to make you feel better. If you do this consistently, you will find that you wake up feeling more refreshed. A very light, slow stretch at night before you sleep can also help you feel more invigorated. Great tips. Um, another question was um, back to foods. Um, specific though for babies and toddlers, are there certain foods that you recommend to support them during um, season changes? You know, I treat a lot of uh, postpartum women, patients of mine who came in for fertility and now I'm treating them through the, uh, um, and, and when they start lactating. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention just as a caveat, because that's a really great question, is that anything that a mother is eating is going into the baby. And so any kind of food intolerances or just things that are more difficult need to be introduced later. And so if your baby is having some kind of digestive uh, disorder or just being more restless, you can really try to simplify the foods that the mom is eating. Because even though I, I know people want to go back to eating sushi immediately after they have, a, have their child, but it's, it's really critical because of the lactation to make sure that the things that you're eating are fairly simple, a little bit bland, you know, apples, rice, oatmeal, you know, bananas. Uh, sometimes people can tolerate things like beets, but it's, it's better to push off the cruciferous vegetables until you know how well the baby's digestive system has formed. And um, also, when you're thinking of uh, children, they're little adults, right? <laughs> they're, um, so think about soups, broths, and uh, mashing up things that are more difficult or fibrous, um, but really having children and babies eat simply but broadly from the beginning so that they get used to the tastes and the textures 
of many, many foods because to stay healthier, it's actually important to have a broader diet and uh, to, to keep as close to the earth as possible. Um, what's the difference between uh, Chinese and Korean acupuncture? <laughs> really glad you asked that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Chinese acupuncture is uh, the foundational acupuncture of all of the Asian medicine. At the same time, it seems that each family tradition and each lineage practice held certain ways of doing the needling. I find that typically Chinese acupuncture has slightly bigger, thicker, stronger needles. Um, Korean has thinner, but still some of the longer and medium sized needles. Japanese acupuncture typically has the thinnest needles and they do very, very delicate surface needling just into the skin layer. So they're very different in the way they approach, but they're based on the same theory. One thing with Korean acupuncture also is that we focus a lot on the hands and the hand points and face reading and constitutional medicine. So it is a little bit different in that way. And Japanese acupuncture really focuses a lot on the hara, the abdominal acupuncture and really doing diagnosis through abdominal. I know this is something that you also specialize in your own practice is working a lot in uh, mental health um, and emotions, stress. Um, some uh, attendees today asked about learning more about the benefits of TCM with regards to mental health. Thanks, that's my favorite topic actually. <laughs> So I really appreciate the question and all the listeners who asked those questions. Chinese medicine, unlike Western medicine, does not distinguish between the psyche and the body, right? So your relationships within the family, your mind, heart, spirit, body, all live in the same place. And science agrees with this. It's not like there's some fictional holographic space where the mind is, right? So if you're having really terrible digestion and lots of constipation, your mind is probably not gonna be that clear. <laughs> if you find yourself having a really, really terrible day, take some large breaths, go for a quick walk, drink two big pints of warm water, and you might already start to feel better. Um, to be more specific about mind, heart, and Chinese medicine, I would say that because everything is very integrated in the body, we are looking at all of these levels every time we treat anything. So even if it's a, you come in for an ankle injury or my patient yesterday has an injury to his psoas muscle, but what I discovered is that his entire body was locked up from head to toe and he was quite sensitive, um, even with tiny half inch Korean needles. And so then I, I just opened it up for, have you been experiencing anything stressful uh, lately? And apparently he had the closest relationship with his father of anybody that I've I've ever met really, he described him as his best friend and he had passed away three years ago. And as he started talking about this, the, as, and I, I was palpating his, his uh, quadriceps femoris and also his upper shoulders, literally the tissues started to lay down flatter. And I, I'm not joking about this, that when people are able to locate the source of their stress, they are able to also release that. And what's great about Chinese medicine, what I like to call Chinese medicine psychology um, is that you don't have to concoct the story out there because we are getting confirmation from the body and the body will tell you if you're on the right concept or not. And so as we worked on it, the legs in the back and he was able to share and express, I did ask, how are you doing with your grief process? Have you been able to uh, fully grieve? And, and he, he was able to share that he was not yet 
finished, but didn't even feel like he had begun. Mm -hmm. So that completely made sense to me because it seemed to me that the body tension in one shoulder was much higher, was like the whole body was crying. The whole body was holding and hadn't even gone through the part of grieving that is just the shock that happens in the beginning. So uh, yes, Chinese medicine, we are going to be asking about your emotions, your relationships, and in the process of working with the body and also uh, people's understanding, both things lighten. The body lightens and the emotions and spirit lighten. And then you see a new picture. Yeah, that's a really great example of how I think emotions sort of get trapped in our body. And then when they're trapped, then it affects like all these other parts of our body. And it's important to be able to move through and express emotions and in order for us to feel good. And I think what I also like is in Chinese medicine, you know, there are no like good or bad emotions, you know, in I think Western culture, we often talk like angry is bad or sad is bad, you know, happy is good. Um, but I think Chinese medicine, is, it's very holistic in the sense like each um, emotion kind of balances the others out. Um, um, we have time for just one more question. Uh, oh, did you have something to add? Oh. <laughs> Take Ian's question at the end, Ian Hua. Oh, yes. Are there certain foods to elevate one's mood during the pandemic? Oh. Um, where so many of us are isolated. Is that the one? Oh, oh, no. Ian Hua, how does the spiritual aspect of TCM inform your practice and what do your patients take away from their treatments beyond just feeling better? Do you see that on your screen? Yes. Um, yes. Okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. I really love this question um, because I think that especially, and this kind of does pick up on the other question that you would ask during the pandemic, health is not just being without illness or injury. Health and wellness has a spirit to it. It has hopefulness. It has something beyond the material world that helps you. And when you lack that, that fire or passion or connection or feeling of safety, you cannot be healthy, right? So the spiritual aspect beyond the emotions is also an aspect of health and wellness that people need to begin to engage with and pay attention to because we don't live because we happen to be alive. We live because we're here spiritually and we feel that we have a way to move forward. Thank you so much. Um, that's all the time we have for today, but um, thank you so much, Dr. Cho, um, for putting together such a great presentation and um, answering some of our questions. If any of you um, in the audience are interested in learning more about Chinese medicine, um, we will regularly be putting together webinars um, with faculty and alumni sharing more about the medicine. Um, in the meantime, you are welcome to schedule appointment at our student clinic um, in Petrero Hill. Um, and I think they're doing telemedicine um, still um, if you're not local to the area. Um, and also if um, any of you are interested in learning more about the master's and the doctoral programs offered at ACTCM, um, there is an upcoming information session on February 23rd from five to 6 p.m. Um, and you can register online for that. Um, yes, there will be a recording of this webinar and it will post, be posted to our uh, social channels um, and YouTube. So thank you again so much, Dr. Cho. Thank you, thank you Rachel M. Happy you New Year, everyone. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.